Just like the uh, TV station where you're looking straight at the camera waiting to be yeah. on. Okay. We're, we're on. Okay. Today is Monday, March 28th, 2011. Uh, my name is Tony Hilliard, and I'm here with Phil Enslow. We're volunteers at the Atlanta History Center, and we're here today to interview Mr. Ron Sherman for the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project. Mr. Sherman has agreed to share his experience, his military experience with us uh, about his tour in Vietnam for the History Project. Can you give me your full name, please? Ronald Allen Sherman. Ron, can you just give us a little bit of your background and where you, how you grew up? And, and, uh... Uh, born in, in Cleveland, Ohio, went to uh, elementary school in East Cleveland and then moved to University Heights in fourth grade. Uh, and spent the remainder of my years there. My dad was a, a mechanical engineer who uh, worked for the government in a, some kind of uh, munitions plant, designing munitions during World War II. Uh, my mom was a uh, homemaker, and uh, later on my dad opened a grocery store in downtown Cleveland, which I had the honor of uh, working for. Uh, three buses from East Cleveland to our University Heights, and. Um, Went to um, college at Rochester Institute of Technology, I got a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree there, and then uh, after Vietnam, went to Syracuse University and got a Master's in Communication. Okay. Um, were you involved in ROTC in college, or how did you how did you become involved in the military? Well, that's <laughs> that's in a way an interesting story. When I got out of college in '64. Um, the University of Florida offered me a, uh, a position as staff photographer down there, but they said it would be an academic position, which theoretically would keep me out of the service, but uh, that never happened. So when I saw that I couldn't stay out of the military that way, I went to graduate school, and then my draft board said, um, you know, at the end of the school year, whether you graduate or not, we're getting you. So. Um, I did apply to the Peace Corps and about, um, and I told them that I was going to be getting drafted and uh, decided to want to go that route so I looked around for the various services and uh, felt like the Army had the best program for me uh, as a, uh, I've been doing photography since I was 14 years old and went to college for photography. I figured Signal Corps would be the way to go so I enlisted for the um, OCS program uh, in the Army Signal Corps. Uh, figuring uh, two years and um, ten months was better than being drafted and uh, carrying a rifle. And it had, I thought, a better way of using my um, abilities than the other services. And about uh, a month into basic training, I got a letter from the um, Peace Corps saying, uh, we're ready for you. And I said, well, I'm not ready for you right now. And then they said, well, when I wrote them back, they said, well, when you get out of the Army, come see us. And I said, right, you didn't understand the situation. So um, so that's... Uh, what year was that? What? 1966. 1966. Were, what was what was the reaction to your family when you, I mean, you knew it was coming, but I mean, when you enlisted? It's, it's you know, uh, my mom and dad really, you know, they weren't for or against it. I mean, there was no, no reaction at all. Um, I just felt like that was what I had to do. Uh, I had a chance at the time to um, join a newspaper in um, Florida um, at um, uh, in, in Central Florida. The paper I was working for in Rochester, um, the, the director of photography said, uh, "We just bought Coco today, and with your color background uh, in photography, we we're experimenting with color photography. Uh, you could go down there, and, I, and the choice was." Unless are going to Gainesville and working, or, or going to Florida and joining the reserves, and since my goal was Life Magazine, I wanted to be a Life Magazine photographer. I felt like my Life Magazine chance would come along about the time I'd have to go into reserve duty right. or stuff like that. So I felt like I'd go in and, and get it over with. But um, uh, that uh, it really was no reaction at all. I mean, I don't remember having any conversations with my folks when. I decided to. to well, when, when you enlisted, would, I'm trying to remember, and I, I really can't, was there much in the media about Vietnam in the 66 time frame? And that's uh, the reason. Oh, yeah. I well, I, again, being a photojournalist, I was, you know, watching the guys that were going over there and covering it and, and um, um, just 
you know, I, I basically came south because I wanted to cover the civil rights movement. I thought that would be important to document. So, uh, you know, Vietnam at the time really wasn't on my radar in terms of, well, I really want to go over there and cover it. So, you know, and then given the choice of that I had, I just felt like doing it, going this way would be my best, okay. best alternative. And by ex being accepted in the program, I felt like uh, I had a pretty good shot. And the biggest shock to me was when I got finished with OCS uh, and my uh, duty assignment came down as 8500 photo officer, I was very happy. I felt That's like, geez, somebody goofed and they put me in a position that I can do something. Well, well tell us about, you know, how your military experience began. I mean, I know you, you enlisted and then you went off to where? Uh, yeah, I enlisted in May of 66 and uh, spent uh, basic training in AIT at Fort Jackson and then um, went to Fort Gordon for OCS and I think I'm one of the few people that instead of having the uh, six-month OCS tour, I had seven months because when I was in college, I was active in fraternity and student government and, and became president of both my uh, fraternity chapter and the student government. So when I got to OCS, for some reason, they decided to elect me as the ca uh, class leader. Well, <clears throat> whoever the TAC officer was in my OCS class, and the name was long forgotten, decided he didn't like college graduates. And as class leader, I just felt like um, the first two months were supposed to be basic uh, candidates and you treated, you know, lower than dirt. And then the second two months, you were supposed to be elevated a little bit. And uh, the third two months, you were supposed to be treated almost like an officer. Well, this guy must have forgotten the rule book because the second two months, we were treated much worse or no better than the first two months. And of course, with my mouth, I decided to object to the way we were being treated and all, everything else. And he took umbrage to that and um, tried to um, eliminate me from the program. So they, I was called in front of the commander of the uh, of the OCS and um, Major Lieutenant Colonel. I don't remember exactly who it was. Sat down and he asked me to explain my position, and I told him what I thought was going on and. He said, well, you got two choices. Uh, you can leave the program, become a, uh, E5 and do this or do that, or you can stay in the program and we'll put you back a month and you can, you know, go to a, another class. And I said, well, I prefer the second. I mean, one more month isn't going to be that much of a problem. The, uh, the nice part of all that was when I moved up in the, the ranking uh, as a um, senior um, or as the last two months, we were treated much better through the whole process than the class I had left. And so as, as I saw the guys graduating the month ahead of me, they were treated almost as badly as when they first came in. I figured, well, I won that one, and then I got my uh, 8500 MOS, and I, I was very happy about that. When you got your, where did you train? Where, where did your MOS take you to school, or did you? Well, I was assigned to the, um, Originally, I was assigned to, uh, from, um, uh, from OCS, I was assigned to uh, the 1st MI Battalion, uh, which was forming, or the 45th, which was MI Battalion, uh, which was forming up at Fort um, Bragg, North Carolina. And that was in, that was summertime. And they sent me up to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, for a couple months of, uh, there was a photo officer school up there, which was, truly almost a vacation for me because what they were teaching me I had learned it in Rochester years ago and so it was in the, the class is small I think there were 15 or 20 of us all together so we had a, a real good time uh, learning you know I mean the army way in, in terms of film and, and uh, the speed graphic which I had given up years before and stuff like that so it was uh, I wouldn't call it a two-month vacation but because we had to take classes and and um, and learn, um, but um, it was one of those um, experiences that uh, that I would appreciate. I'd like to go back again. Um, when I was um, in OCS, I had the camera with me, and they, and the, again, this was the second group. They allowed me to um, do photos, and so here's a picture story that was run in the Cleveland Plain Dealer uh, in January of uh, 2007. Um, 
that the paper that I'd worked with when I was in high school uh, had run the five pages of the story about making it through OCS. And uh, the title was How I Became an Officer. And uh, the little caption underneath says, Ron Sherman managed to serve uh, it survived the rigors of OCS and graduated last spring and commissioned a second lieutenant. That publication time is serving in Saigon, Vietnam. And the big picture, this is me learning the, the ropes and the caption underneath it says um, that he, he learned to get down the, the, um, the rope by using his feet. So, um, and then this is my commission when I was commissioned second lieutenant in uh, work for Gordon. But, um, so I was uh, basically uh, stationed at Fort um, uh, Fort Bragg for the summer, and there really wasn't a whole lot to do. My uh, one of my roommates was an Airborne Ranger, and he invited me to go along on a jump. I did go on the plane. I didn't carry a parachute, but I did take pictures of him jumping. Uh, he was one of my friends who was killed in Vietnam okay. during his stay over there. Well, let me ask you a question. I made it. I don't know whether there's a connection or not, but you mentioned you went to college in Rochester. Mm -hmm. Did that have any? Uh, did you have any experience with the Kodak people up in Rochester? Was it? Was that? Did it? Was that any any reason for going up there? Or, or well, you... RIT had the probably the best program of photography in the country at the time. And okay. I think they still do. Uh, I was considering Ohio U for further journalism. There was a school out in California, but just looking at um, at RIT, uh, it, it had kind of a friend of mine who was two years older than me from high school had gone there and really liked it. Um, but um, it was, um, and they, had, and there was a scholarship that I was up for and I didn't get, and the guy who got it was out, uh, dropped out the following year, so it didn't, I said, well, see, they picked the wrong guy. But RIT at the time had a very good reputation. And um, I had been shooting pictures for my high school newspaper when I was in middle school and junior high and in high school and started working for the Cleveland Press, Cleveland Plain Dealer as a freelance photographer, um, student photographer they called it back then. So Friday night football games I would uh, I would cover our high school team and another team and go home and process the pictures and go down to the morning paper which had the evening deadline, try to sell a couple pictures to them and get up the next morning and go to the two afternoon. There were two afternoon papers in Cleveland at the time and my best day was uh, Six pictures and three papers, and I think I made a total of sixty dollars, but ten bucks a piece. But that was good money yeah, back good. then. Yeah. Help pay for the first year at RIT, but that helped me get into the Cleveland Press as a copy boy. My summer between high school and college, and then came back the next summer as a summer intern photographer, and that helped me get a job in Rochester on the staff as a part-time guy and then full-time. But that got to be burdensome trying to go to school full-time and working full-time. So. Uh, I end up sharing the job with somebody else, and that helped. That that was the my boss in Rochester was the one that tried to get me to Coco Today. As it turned out, the Coco Today job could have led to me being on USA Today because that was their experiment. They were okay. going to start a national newspaper, and Coco Today was the way they were going to develop the presses for doing color all over the country. But um, I went a different direction. Okay. So so when. When you completed your military uh, photography training, what was the next step? What happened next? Back to um, uh, Fort Bragg, waiting for the unit to, to fill up. Well, I was the 45th MI detachment was a support detachment, um, and basically their job was um, to inter photo interpretation. And most of the guys there um, were college graduates who were photo interpreters. My job was. Um, the photo lab connected to the, each detachment was to get Air Force photography that they photographed, you know, the big film that they photographed and um, make prints. So we had a processing machine that would take the film and put it on the paper, run it through a light, and then go through a processor and then come out dry at the other end, be cut up, and then the interpreters could interpret. <coughs> uh, <coughs> to, uh, so basically, my job was to make sure they had chemicals and paper because my uh, I had a, uh, a sergeant, staff sergeant who had um, served in Korea and could take this machine apart, blindfold, and put it back together again. So basically, my job in Vietnam was uh, was that. But 
just getting the unit formed up took some months. So basically I did a lot of reading there. There was really no duties for me once I got back from Fort Mama. And um, then we, uh, we headed out to um, Vietnam in uh, November of 67. Um, uh, and it was, uh, the photo unit itself was um, uh, like a tractor trailer. So it had to go to Vietnam by boat. And so it was silly for us to stay at Fort Bragg, so we got the boat trip too. So our first three weeks in Vietnam was a cruise from San Francisco through Okinawa. And, uh, and this watch is one I bought in Okinawa, and, and it's still running today. The, the watchman says, be gentle with it. <laughs> Not too many parts left. And um, we, uh, we ended up three weeks later, uh, and I think we landed in Name Cameron Bay, I can't remember exactly. And we were supposed to go to uh, Phuket, but um, somehow or another, I ended up in Saigon because the unit um, was not deployed where it was supposed to go. So I basically ended up in Saigon at the headquarters and headquarters company uh, for a while. And your duties were essentially the same as to make sure you were in charge the technical side of, of processing? Um, well, basically, down there it was. Um, it was just making sure that the other everybody had whatever they needed, and, and actually I, I didn't have many duties in, in terms of of specific. I didn't have anybody I was working for direct, uh, with directly, and so I started doing some aerial photography on my own, and um, and and doing projects. And in one particular project, uh, which I'm most proud of at the time, was the Air Force photography took anywhere from three to five days to get from the plane to the Air Force, to us, to the interpreters. And uh, division commanders were having a problem with that time frame because things would change so quickly. So I was approached with, uh, is there a way that we can speed up the process for the commanders just to see a look-see kind of thing. And Of course, that was way before digital, but Pentax had just come out with a camera that had a, a motor drive on it. and. Um, so I was experimenting with, I was going up and shooting with the same camera anyhow, uh, basically developed a, what I call the handheld photo program, which they asked me to then develop into something that, that could be used in all the divisions. And it was basically to go out and do a, do a, a sh shoot of a particular area and see what the time frame would be. Well, all the divisions had labs and they all had photographers, or they all had pilots and they all had planes. So the camera was simple enough that you set the um, you set the shutter speed and the lens would open and close as lighting conditions uh, demanded. Um, put a roll of 36 exposure trix in there, and the pilot can or the whoever, the observer can go out and shoot out the window what they want. And within three four hours, the commander has prints that he takes it back to the divisional photo lab. So I basically developed the program, wrote the SOP, uh, wrote the, uh, got it printed, published, and then they asked me to go around to the divisions and explain to everybody what they were getting. That's interesting. And, uh, and then the worst part of the job was they asked me to go to Japan and buy the cameras and lenses. So I didn't carry the money. That they had a lieutenant, uh, a colonel go, go with me. And uh, so um, we spent a, a week in Japan and uh, Truthfully, it only took a day or two, but you know, I didn't book the flight. So, so, so what would a typical photo mission be like for that? I mean, was it a fixed-wing aircraft, yeah, or a helicopter? Most, well, whatever they had, it could be. In most cases, it was probably a, a, a Piper or something that they had. They could get up quickly, shoot out the window, and come back. Because, like, say they had taken out a bridge the day before, they wanted to go up the next day and see if it had been rebuilt. So they know if they had to send somebody out again, or whatever, whatever it was. Or we're going into a, an area, uh, we want to see what it looks like. So they had almost not instantaneous or photography, but it was a lot quicker than the other. So did they have to use uh, stereo things, or were they? Able no, to they see? would just. They were basically just eight by ten prints that they could. It was for the commander. Right. There was no. I don't think there was much interpretation. I think it was just simply the commander, or the, they could give it to whoever was going on the operation and say, "This was shot yesterday, or this was shot this morning," kind of thing and just be quick in turning it around. 
So did you spend most of your tour associated with the program you developed? No, that was just one small part of it. Uh, and then uh, later on, uh, and then TEP, during TEP, uh, we were in Saigon and we were saved by, I think it was the first, uh, it was a mechanic, I uh, can't remember, it was a mechanical, uh, I'm trying to think, first, uh, air, not air chaos, it was, the tanks came up, okay. the, the main, because we were on the main route to, um, to Tonson and our, our billets were right there and the night before we were sitting on the roof watching the fireworks and then we were watching the rest of the fireworks. So this was Tet 68? 68, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was in Saigon at the time and uh, I was back there in, in 2004 and could not find where I lived. Uh, they had changed the street so much that it was like very difficult. I think the place is still there but I, I didn't write down the address so I'm sorry for me to find it. But um, And uh, then I um, um, got a request from a general who was going up looking. There was a sniper at the end of Thompson. This was, I think, a week or so after Tet. He's shooting at planes as they were coming and going out. So this this officer decided he wanted to go take a look-see, and he wanted the cameraman to go along with him. So um, we fly out of Thompson, and we fly around, we're flying low and all that. You know, I don't know, about 45 minutes into the mission, all of a sudden we hear a mayday, mayday over the headset. I've been shot, I've been shot. I'm looking around, general looks at me, and I look at him, and because we, we were sitting on flak jackets and we had flak jackets on, and so the pilot makes an emergency landing to Tonson, and there's no blood, no nothing uh, that, that we could see land. The bullet had come through underneath the, the, the canopy and hit him on the bottom of the foot, stuck into his shoe. And so I, I ran into him about a month later, and he still, no one would let him forget that story. So, but uh, we did find the guy, I mean, there, and uh, later on we heard there was a puff of smoke where he had been. So oh, okay. that, that had taken care of that little problem because they were able to. Um, but uh, then I went up to, um, then f uh, they asked me to go up to Fubai uh, for, the, for the 45th. It was finally uh, settled and um, and basically run the, the uh, operation up there in Wei Fubai. And so that was where the second half of my tour was. But uh, during that tour, uh, and, and basically, um, again, I had the lab was set up and I basically had to go out and, and scrounge uh, uh, paper and, and chemicals that I couldn't get right away. Uh, and actually helped out because there were, you know, we, we had I think three or four other units around, so it was a matter of going to them and helping them out when they needed film and, and back and forth to make sure we had everything. But the, um, and the nice thing about the lab was there was a um, air conditioner in there so we had, it, now still it was 80 degrees instead of uh, 70 that was supposed to be in a regular photo lab and we had to, uh, for, the, for the film processing when I was doing my film that I had shot, we had to use techniques of, um, of, of high temperature processing so that we could try and keep the, the, the motion on the, right. on the stock and not have it slide off kind of thing. But, um, so did, were you also involved in going out and, and uh, like the program you established taking those quick response? No, because we weren't attached to a division. We were okay. basically, I was just, I was doing other kinds of projects and, uh, and the most exciting project for me was classified top secret until I read about it in Newsweek uh, a few years after. I actually looked for the article, it was in Periscope, and I called my old boss and who, who stayed in and I said, hey, I just read about my mission in Periscope uh, in Newsweek, is it okay if I talk about it now? I said, yeah, they, CIA uses it to sort of tweak the North Vietnamese, let them know that they've been had. And what it was, was um, I was uh, sent to Yuban, Thailand, we work with a uh, Air Force spotters and the O2 plane, push pull airplane with the rocket pods on there, and that'd be me with the lens I was using. Um, what they had discovered was a shining, something glowing in the treetops, uh, pilots as they were coming back into Yuban, um, and it was in the vicinity of Ashaw Valley, but they they just spotted something glowing. They weren't sure what it was at sunset. So then they tried to, to um, spot it again, and then somebody else had spotted it, but they weren't sure exactly where it had been, because it was just one of those things they said, I saw something's low. 
So they invited me to uh, go to Yuban and uh, fly with the aerial observers and uh, try and photograph it. So um, we had I land in Yuban. It was really nice because there was one of those corporate jets that uh, type jets that the Air Force had, and uh, so I flew over there. And that, that was you know first class. And I uh, got to the air base there and land, and they tell me where to go. And as I'm land, as I'm walking over there, uh, I see these little airplanes. You know, they all different size airplanes there. And I walk in and meet the major and the lieutenant colonel and the, all the all these guys who are the pilots. And on the table there, there was an eight by ten print of a plane, uh, O2, what we were going to be flying, half shot away, and there was not much left. And the first thing I said was, "This is what we're flying." And he says. Lieutenant, it made it back. So I said, okay, well, I, I, I could come live with that. And so we went up for, and these guys actually had two missions. They had my mission, which was authorized by uh, J2 MACV and Saigon, and then their mission, which was supporting the, the jets coming in to do the bombing. So that's why they had the rocket pods on, because they were the aerial observers and, and the guys that did the spotting and stuff like that. I think the second day we're up, I see all this flak going off above us. And I said, like a dummy, what's that? He said, well, they're waiting for the jets to come in and they want to try and interfere with them. I said, do you guys ever get hit? He says, eh, occasionally. So <laughs> that, was my, that was my exposure to, uh, to aerial combat. But um, I was there about three or four days and really didn't see anything because I was basically just keeping my eyes open. And the second last day or the last day, we're flying back and we, I see it. But it was way too late, and the I mean, it was just the sun was already down, and the camera was good and had a big, heavy lens on it. But so I land and call Saigon and said, "Well, I think we got it. We got the coordinates." He said, "Well, I, you know, another day or two, you'll be fine." So I um, we go back up, and we go up earlier in the day. But that day, the mission was just find the find the sucker. But the best thing was late in the afternoon, so that the sunlight would hit it. And what the North Vietnamese had done is run a phone line through the trees from North Vietnam down into this area. And uh, my understanding was they wanted the SEAL team to go in and tap it and see what was going on. So I got back, got back to Saigon, made the prints, and put the story away in the back of my head and said, okay, uh, nice adventure. Too bad I can't tell anybody. But eventually, I guess it was okay. Well, how, how, mu how much later? Did you read it? Read about it in the newspaper? Well, my wife says it was when we were in Syracuse in graduate school. I thought it was, or she said it was in Milwaukee, but I think it was later. I think it was a year. Well, it was a couple years after okay. after that. So I mean, we still weren't out of Vietnam at the time. I know it was that time frame. In fact, I tried to search the archives and um, of Newsweek archives, and that's been impossible. I'll be in New York next week, and I may go by there and see if I can go look at the old magazines. Cause I thought I had cut it out and. Put it somewhere, but, you know. It was uh, one of those stories I could finally tell. So, about how far into your tour was that when you when you finished that business with the Air Force? Uh, just as 1968. So I think it would have been. Uh, well, I came back in uh, October. So it would probably have been uh, almost about two thirds of the way through. Okay, so you spent the remainder of your remainder of your tour up in the in Fubai, yeah. in Fubai, yeah, just running the lab, making sure that. Um, well, Fubai and that whole area, the way Fubai area, I mean, the the heaviest fighting was in the early part of 1968. But yeah. what about when you were there? What was it like then? Um, quite. I mean, uh, we did have one mortar attack. I remember distinctly because um, next morning I went up. I knew none of my guys had gotten hurt. I went out just to see what the damage was. And I see this guy using the outdoor facility way off into the distance. And I said, I think I know that guy. So we pulled over and I got out. And it turned out it was an old friend of mine from Atlanta who was a, a UPI photographer, United Person International photographer. And um, he wanted to come to Vietnam and cover it. And UPI wouldn't send him, so he joined the Associated Press AP. And so he had been in the in the billets um, the, where the press could stay the night before. So he was out doing his business, and here halfway around the world, he's there. Did Did you have any interaction with any of the the media reps? I mean, I know you were in the military intelligence yeah. unit, but no. Uh, <laughs> except at the Saigon Bar, um, 
a week a week or so, maybe a month later, I'm, I walk into the place and there was somebody who had just come in the country and I was taking them to one of the better restaurants. It was the International House in, in Saigon. And there at the piano bar was uh, Joe Holloway, the guy I met, and Horst Foss, who was a famous AP photographer who was leaving. So they were having a goodbye party for Horst and invited me to join. And, and uh, so when it got late, we headed off to their apartment where they were, and it got a little bit later. And then it was, I think, about 2 a.m., past curfew, and I told the uh, my guest, uh, hang on, because we're going to have a, a little wild ride. So with the lights off and me blasting my horn going through the, the different uh, Vietnamese uh, roadblocks, I just got back, and he says, I don't think I'll go out with you again at night. But, it was, you know, no one fired on us, so we were fine. But that was back in Saigon or earlier, earlier in my tour. But, um, well, the the last part of your tour, I mean, was it just pretty much routine up at the? It was the forty fifth military yeah. intelligence battalion up there. Yeah, I mean, routine if you consider yeah. the uh, the uh, U bond ex experience right. and everything. But there was no, you know, there, there was no real action in, in our area. As I say, I, that the only only time I remember us being under attack was at one. Time that and it yeah. might have happened before, but there was no. Uh, we had some, you know, good defense there in terms of uh, our location. When we were at the air base, so that was being that was going to be heavily defended. But um, yeah, I just remember it was the armor cab unit that came through okay. Saigon that, that protected us. And well, that that must have been a scary experience. I mean, uh, when they got up into Saigon and, and uh, were you? I know you said they were you were along the route where they yeah. where they would have had to come. I mean, yeah, but we never. I mean, we never. I think if we took fire, it was from Ameri you know, it was from okay. American, you know, getting excited or something like that. American fire. You just hunkered down. Oh yeah, yeah. We were. I mean, we had our weapons and we could defend the thing, defend the place. But they were they're going after the presidential palace. And right. In fact, my friend uh, Joe Holloway did cover the. He was in Saigon and did cover his pictures. Um, made it to the, to the national press. But no, I, I didn't have really, I did go look up the uh, bureau manager for UPI Photos in Saigon who offered me a job if I wanted to stay there. But uh, I had thoughts about staying, because I had six months to, uh, to serve when I when my tour was up, which meant I still had six months to go. And a good friend of mine from Gainesville, Florida, uh, Bob Ellison, who was a freelance photographer, was over there and we never got to meet each other. We were exchanging letters and he suggested, well, why don't you stay three months because I got this really cool deal and, and you could, you know, get out early and, and we could work together. Well, Bob was the photographer that shot the Quezon photos and was killed after he went back to Quezon to deliver the beer and whatever to the Marines that he stayed with and the plane that he took off on um, was shot down. And also about the same time my dad passed away. and. Mm -hmm. uh, I decided my mom needed me more than, than me staying in Vietnam. So when October came, I was very glad to back up and go. When you came back, um, I guess two questions. You came into the West Coast and then well, came San back Francisco. In fact, what, was, what was that experience like? Well, that was very interesting. Um, I came back with our uh, administrative officer. He was rotated the same time I did. So we I think we were at Cameron Bay for a while, a day or so, and finally got our flight back. And let's just say that I didn't remember too much of the first day or two in San Francisco. We did rent a, a, a hotel room, but after we checked in, we really didn't see each other. Uh, I don't know where he went, he didn't know where I went. Uh, the big shock was when you went to the, one of the bars and you saw the way the girls were dressed or not dressed. That had changed a lot in the year. Um, Truthfully, I there was no. I didn't have any negative feedback because of my haircut or because of, of my dress or anything like that. I just don't remember anybody ever saying anything to me, uh, which was fine. Um, and then when I finally was able to travel, I uh, got on a plane and went to Chicago to see one of my friends who I served with in Vietnam. He was living in Chicago. He was already out living in Chicago. And then um, the funny thing about the, the, my social situation was I was unattached when I went to Vietnam. 
and uh, went to see my sister in Milwaukee uh, before I left for Vietnam. And um, she says, I had uh, a couple friends, single friends upstairs. Would you like me to invite them to dinner? I said, sure. You know, so as the evening progressed later on, I mentioned to one of the two young ladies, well, if you want to support your troops in Vietnam, um, I like chocolate chip cookies. And I let it go with that, you know, left and did my whole tour. And about a month before I come back, I get this box. Well, my sister had moved from this apartment complex to the house. So I was familiar with the address, but I wasn't familiar with the name. And it was a whole box of Congo squares and chocolate chip cookies. I said, okay, I now remember who this is, you know. And of course, living with four other officers, it lasted about 30 seconds. So on my trip from back to Cleveland, I went to Milwaukee to see my sister, and I called up my future wife. <laughs> and they say the rest is sort of history. So I was um, stationed in Cleveland. At, uh, uh, I asked for Cleveland duty, but because of um, what, because of my dad passing and all that, and I ended up at the um, Cleveland, Ohio Air Defense Unit, which had. Uh, six officers all together, only one, well, they had a signal, actually they had two slots for signal officer, uh, and uh, the, the headquarters for whatever unit I was in was at Selfridge Air Force Base in Michigan, so I drive up to Michigan, meet my commanding officer who was a captain, and he says, well, good luck in Cleveland, you know, there's not much to do there, so got a lot of reading done, and then right after I got there, a newly minted second lieutenant, or second lieutenant came in, who had just gone through crypto school, so I made him crypto officer, and, um, and, and you know, it was just a very quiet six months, but um, it was also the worst time in my life, being in the Army. Uh, and the reason was, uh, there were a few officers at this unit, and when you, uh, when you were the uh, officer of the day, OD, uh, you had the responsibility to notify families who lost missing and I caught it about four times three or four times I don't remember exactly uh, every time I caught, got OD and no one else had caught it in a month or how, however long it was as I say there weren't too many officers who could do it because um, there weren't that many there and at the fourth time the family wasn't home and they had to sit in my car and I was totally unprepared for it and the first one I met, the lady was pregnant, first time I did it. And it stuck with me all these years. I, after the fourth one, I went to the commanding officer and I said, I've got a problem and I hope you can help me out. And he said, you're off duty. He said, you don't have to do it anymore. And I think the Army did not train me for that. I had no idea what I was getting into. Didn't know how to handle it. Stayed with me for years. I still had nightmares about it. But uh, I see my mom, I see my sister. Yeah. Coming to that door, but um, I did get help. There was uh, in Atlanta. There was um, a uh, Vietnam support group, and I did go there for a while, and they were very helpful. Other Vietnam veterans who were obviously facing a lot more tragic things than me, but for a 26-year-old, it was it's hard. hard. And uh, just read about um, a Marine major, Lieutenant Colonel, who went through that at a base. Yeah. At, uh, and so, you know, and even he had to ask for relief. So, that one of those things that I had thought of when I first had to do it. And uh, when I see something come on TV, yeah. can't watch it. So when when you you left the army while you were in Cleveland, correct? Yes. <laughs> Did you stay or? No, uh, I have two sisters, one you know, four and a half years older and one four and a half years younger, and all three of us bailed out of Cleveland soon as we could. I left when I went to RIT, uh, and, okay. and the summer between freshman and sophomore year was the last time I was there except for my six-month duty there. And um, I didn't really think about my duty there, but you know, you had possibly a nuclear <laughs> warhead sitting a few minutes from your desk kind of thing there. But, didn't really sink in at the time, didn't really think much about it. But no, we, um, and I'm thankful that two of my three kids live in the Atlanta area, so. Uh, well, well how, did, how did you get from the north or the northeast to Atlanta? 
Well, when I was in Gainesville at the University of Florida, I had met a number of people since I was of the graduate school age. I met a number of people who lived in Atlanta. So, like vacation time, I got invited up here like for Christmas and for not spring break. But so I come up to Atlanta, and then Atlanta was uh, Kodak had a big facility here, and so I come up for workshops that the university would send me up to. So basically, fell in love with Atlanta back then, and um, when I got out of the army, um, I was. My sister was in a house in Milwaukee and said, um, I, I didn't know where I wanted to go. Uh, I had actually gone to New York to talk to some people there. I had uh, uh, a relationship with the United Press International, and then I knew the uh, picture editor at Life Magazine, because life was my goal. And both of them said to me, you know, my decision, do I go to graduate school, do I start freelancing, what do I do, find a job somewhere. And um, and flash back for a second, uh, you asked about Eastman Kodak and and um, in, in Rochester, uh, RIT uh, taught both illustrators, photo illustrators, photographers, and photo science guys, the guys that work for uh, Kodak and Bosch and Lawn and all the companies. And there were probably 30 guys or 40 guys who were in the photo science department, and maybe 15, 20 of us illustrators. Well, on the uh, board for jobs for seniors, there'd be 90. 5% of the job offers would be for the photo science guys, and maybe a photo lab would, or a photo studio would be looking for a photographer. In most cases, they were to be sweeping up the floor. The University of Florida did have a job posted there. That's how I, I got in touch with them. So, um, <clears throat> so Atlanta uh, basically was, was in the back of my mind. Well, when I was in the Army, both uh, Martin Luther King and, uh, and um, uh, Kennedy was killed at the time, and, and those would have been the people I would have been covering had I been, you know, down south. Because my thought was, if it hadn't been for the Army, I probably would have moved to Atlanta back then, just because that's where things seemed to be. So uh, both the uh, picture editor, uh, executive picture director at, at UPI and picture editor at Life Magazine said, well, you know, the way the economy is and all that, maybe you should go to graduate school. And both to a person said, with my 35 years of experience, I can't teach at a college because I don't have a master's degree. So why don't you go get that out of the way and then you know come back and see me in a couple of years. So I ended up in Milwaukee. My sister invited me to come there. She had a, a bedroom on the third floor. And at the time, I was dating my future wife in Cleveland, and I could put on my uniform and go to the airport. And I think for 35 bucks, I could fly to Milwaukee. So I'd be driving. Yeah. So we started communicating. Our, Back she'd come to Cleveland, I'd go to Milwaukee kind of thing. And when it was time to get out of the service, uh, she said, just come to Milwaukee and see what's going on. And about a week or two after I was there, um, I had talked to the newspaper and they hired me as a part-timer. It's come for, we have somebody going to the reserves for, what was it, a month or so, whatever the reserve duty was. Can you fill in for him? And then somebody was leaving for somewhere else. Can you fill in for a few more months? And I had been accepted to Syracuse for graduate school in Ohio U, but I, uh, I decided Syracuse would be the place to go because GI Bill and there was an assistantship available. And um, so I get the job at the Milwaukee Journal, and he said, Well, can you stay till January now? So I call up the Syracuse and say, Well, I'm thinking about coming in January, and because they hadn't offered me the assistantship. And he says, Well, by the way, um, the gentleman we offered the assistantship to turned it down. Would you like to have it? So I said, okay, let me get back to you on that. So I go to my boss at the Milwaukee Journal, and he said, um, won't stand in your way. I said, I know you accepted the job, you know, I accepted the job, and I don't want to keep you short on this run. If you got a chance, go to graduate school. Go to graduate school. So then I went home and there, to my sister's house, and we talked it over, and I asked my wife if she, or my friend at the time, uh, if she'd go to Syracuse with me, and basically it was only one way. So that August we got married and headed to, to Syracuse. And two years in Syracuse, 156 inches of snow. She was teaching school up there while I was going to graduate school in spring of 71. Uh, we uh, pack our vacation car and come down to Atlanta, and the dogwoods were out, these azaleas were blooming, and I, uh, I had a good friend who was in the Army at Fort Mac. Uh, we go see him, and he tells us how great Atlanta is, and then he got transferred to Hawaii or something <laughs> after that. So, and I talked to the wire service people, I talked to the magazine people, and, you know, they said, well, 
we don't really have anybody in Atlanta, so if you go down there, we can probably use you down there. And I come to Atlanta, and I see all these other photographers I didn't know about. But um, it was a great move. I started working for Time and Newsweek, cool. covered the Jimmy Carter campaign in 76. And when, when you were in graduate school, just for the last Vietnam-related question, did, was there... Um, was there an anti-military attitude, or did you experience any uh, hostility? Or, or well, what was funny was um, again, I'm, I'm going back to my photojournalist hat. Uh, I was working with one uh, a, a small-time agency in New York who was selling uh, was basically it was a stock photo agency, and I'd send them photos, and they would market them to the magazines, and we would split, you know, um, the, the fee that they get. They, I do the photography part, they do the marketing part. And the, the agency was so-so agency. And I started hooking up with this big name agency. And the guy who, uh, and I, again, I was at Syracuse at the time, and his comment to me was, there's not much going on on college campuses. I don't think we'd be interested in what you would do for us. I said, okay. And then Berkeley broke out and all that. Yeah, there was some anti-war stuff. In fact, I went to Washington and, and covered the, the march on Washington in, I think it was 71. And I got a great series of photos from there. And in fact, I'm going to uh, do a, a, not a book, but some kind of printed uh, product that uh, I can put out on the market as, as the march on Washington uh, with the gas and the, yeah. you know, the Nixon White House and all that. And the other thing was I was looking at other cities to go to. and. Friends of mine in D.C. said, well, you don't want to come to D.C., the White House doesn't really, you know, not that they'd had an effect on the photography there, but it was just sort of not a great place. I thought New York was not where I wanted to live, and uh, so that's why I moved to Atlanta, it seemed to be the best place. But uh, on-campus stuff, yeah, there was there was rallies, but it wasn't it wasn't like Berkeley, it wasn't like... So you weren't, you weren't the, the focus of any of it? Person. No, my, I let my hair grow out by then. So it was, you know, I just, you know. Now, to, to, to hear the stories I've heard from other people, I saw nothing like, and even when I put my uniform on to go from Cleveland to Milwaukee, um, I didn't have anybody approach me or say anything. Well, that's good. So maybe because it was, I don't know, Cleveland and Milwaukee. I, I had no clue. But And then that was the only time, uh, of course, when I'd be going to work, I'd be wearing khakis and in uniform, but it was to the face and to home and change out. So. so once you got back and you got married, and you, what about your life since then? I mean, do you have children? It's been or? one hell of a ride. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, we moved to Atlanta in 71, and um, my wife, since she had an inner city teaching experience, got hired right away by DeKalb County, which was a godsend. And in 76, we had twin boys born in August, and uh, which was also a godsend because uh, we'd been trying for a while, and, and they came along, and then the Carter campaign came along, and my wife wasn't happy with me over Christmas of 76 because Newsweek called and said, can you go down the plains for a week? Our photographer just broke his arm. So I got off the phone and said, well, Mark, I got some good news. Newsweek's going to hire me for a week in planes. And she says, well, what am I supposed to do with these? Four, five month old little boys. I said, okay. <laughs> but we had great neighbors and great friends, and they all pitched in and helped her out. So, but uh, and then uh, six years later, my daughter came along, and uh, they're all grown now. My daughter uh, has been married uh, three years and is expecting her first child come September. I uh, I have twin boys, one's a neurosurgeon who is uh, doing his fellowship up in uh, New York City right now. He's got a, a daughter four and a half years old, and uh, he and his wife and daughter are moving to D.C. and be at uh, George Washington University Hospital as a assistant professor and uh, um, attending physician starting in August. And his twin brother is a lawyer here in Atlanta, with, uh, married to uh, a young lady who's Israeli American, and um, and they've got uh, two boys, one two and a half, and one six months old. So it's a great time of life. Yeah, I was gonna say it sounds like a good life. It is. We're we're coming up on the on the conclusion. So what we normally do is say, just you know, any comments about your experience in Vietnam, or just comments in general. I mean, your perspective on life, 
liberty and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> um, well, I can't, I can't say, you know, the Army was just another experience in my life. Um, and I had it to do over again, the way things turned out. No, thank you. I'll, I'll be glad. I mean, when you think about the way things worked out, if I hadn't been going to Vietnam, I wouldn't have gone to Milwaukee and went to the, met my wife. So that in itself is <laughs> all the pluses and no minuses. So and surviving over there and not getting shot at, yeah, you know, I mean, getting shot at but not getting wounded and, and meeting some of the people over there. I still keep in touch with my commanding officer uh, who stayed in for his whole career there and um, a few other people. Um, and it was it was just one of those things that happened. I was able to document it. In fact, I forgot how much I did document it until recently because the way um, my business is going, uh, I heavily invested in photographs of Atlanta and Georgia and supposedly had the most complete file of, of photos, but with a digital age, somebody can get pictures of the Atlanta skyline for 10 bucks or nothing, where if they came to me, they'd have to pay a bit more than that. So I'm basically going back and looking at what I shot in the 60s, and 70s, and 80s, and seeing what is um, commercially possible to market and sell. So, and the Army experience and what I have, I mean, I basically documented my Army career, not the whole thing, basic training was, you know, verboten to have a camera, but the OCS part and the Vietnam part um, can be of value to me in the future and, and hopefully to to the people that I will, you know, will be able to, to get the photos. So uh, right now it's like knock on wood so far. Life has been terrific and, God bless you know, and um, my association with the Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association has been very important to me for a number of reasons. One. I mean, I knew there were guys out there who came back and went on with their life, and so I met numerous people who, who have done that. They've been a great resource for me when I needed information and things like that. It's um, great to get together with them and hear some of their stories and um, in the meetings. And, and more importantly, the, the memorials we have every year I think is very important. I'm about to interview one of the ladies who, um, who we had the mor memorial for in East Cobb. Um, a couple years ago because uh, I want to put a uh, multimedia um, show on our website that, talk, that have her talk about the event in, ter in her terms, not from our terms, but what it meant to her. And I have all the photos that I shot at the memorial, so I'll be able to put her voice over the pictures and do a two or three minute uh, presentation that we'll be able to put on That's our website. Too. And that to me uh, is probably the most important aspect of our um, our job, or not job, but the, the belonging to the association yeah. because uh, it has such a greater impact uh, on the community as a whole and to the individuals and what it does for the individual soldier's family who was uh, killed in Vietnam, um, it, to me is, is priceless. Do you have any questions, Phil? No, I don't think so. Well, we appreciate you coming in and sharing the story with us. Uh, you're just a couple minutes shy, and uh, that's fine. But uh, thank you. And, uh, you're welcome. We'll get it off to the Library of Congress. So you don't need these, right, since you have the digital files?